So uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board in Vermont. Um, today is Wednesday, June 26, 2024, and it is 1.05 p.m., and I call this meeting to order. So um, we've had quite a few health issues and outages at our agency, um, so I'm going to keep my remarks short today. Um, I did want to acknowledge the passing of longtime Bennington Senator Dick Sears on June 1st. It's really hard to overstate the impact he's had on every piece of criminal justice reform that's occurred in the state in the past three decades, but I'm going to focus on cannabis. Um, you know, when you look at the guy, you'd think, what could he possibly know about cannabis? And, you know, he'd probably be the first to say not all that much. But he knew at his core the basics, um, that the criminalization of this plant was political and that the lives of the poorest and most vulnerable Vermonters were being ruined as a result. Um, he became the unlikely champion for legalization in 2015, back when this was somewhat of a fringe issue in our legislature and in our state and in the country. Um, he cashed in all of his political favors and put his reputation on the line to get a bill through the Senate in 2016. And um, that bill didn't make it across the finish line, but he kept at it year after year. And in 2018, he got home grow and automatic expungements for cannabis convictions. In 2020, he got tax and regulate. And in 2021, he got a bill through the full Senate that eliminated the potency caps on uh, solid concentrates. So thank you, Senator Sears, your vision and your clarity of mind on harm reduction the role of government and social equity will be sorely missed. Um, I know there's been um, a few other senators uh, that have that were instrumental in cannabis and, and just have a long legacy that will not be returning, um, but um, just wanted to focus on Senator Sears today. Um, other than that, uh, we need to just approve the minutes from our last meeting um, from uh, May 29th, 2024. Is there a motion for that? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so um, we're going to start with public comment. Um, you know, we'll handle this the same way that we always do. If you join by the link, please raise your virtual hand. If you'd like to make a public comment, we'll do our best to call on you in the order that uh, you raise your hand, and then we'll move to people that join by a phone. All right, uh, first hand up is Dave Silverman. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and James, can't agree with you more uh, about Senator Sears and his influence. Uh, and not just on the legalization, but also pushing through our automatic expungement bill. Uh, and also um, his uh, hand was on the language that prohibited you guys from denying licenses to people based on their previous cannabis convictions. So, I mean, Senator Sears was uh, a giant and uh, we'll definitely miss. Um, I brought this up in my comment last month and I hope that uh, you'll be able to speak to it this month. Uh, the portion of the bill that uh, has become law uh, requiring you to impose new geographic siting requirements on retail applicants. Uh, we would love, I think we, like the whole industry, would really love to understand what the CCB's intention with that language is and what it is that we should expect uh, to see. So uh, any comments on that from you would be very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for your work on on uh, Act 164 as well. Thanks. Uh, next hand up, James Lang. Go ahead, James. <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ready. Uh, I'm a IT guy for a few retailers here in uh, Vermont, and today the focus of my comment was just going to be um, the packaging and reuse programs. Uh, from where I'm standing, it just doesn't seem like we've we've made an honest effort to uh, like like subsidize an industrial dishwasher or or figure out how we can guide licensees to best handle consumer packaging waste. Um, my uh, colleague uh, Liz, who uh, runs one of my dispensaries, wrote a great comment. Um, she wasn't able to attend today's meeting, so 
I'd like to just read this comment and then I'll be done. Um, so here's what uh, we, we got uh, together and wrote. Um, I'm writing today in regard to the packaging recycling program. I would like to comment that the board should refocus this program and find new better solutions to this program and make a plan to support licensees making efforts to recycle. We are currently sitting on at least half a ton of returned product packaging with no no direction on where to take it. Uh, there are no, currently no solutions to licensees other than allowing retailers the option to collect, clean, sanitize, and then resell to manufacturers. Uh, this process would require a manufacturer's setup with an indus industrial grade equipment, staffing, and strict sanitation procedures. Uh, to that point, and to my knowledge, the CCB does not define parameters around sanitization of cannabis packaging. The lack of guidance on this matter feels like a violation of Act 148. Vermont and our licensees care about where our waste is going, and I urge the CCB to step in to create a comprehensive recycling program for our industry. Uh, but uh, that will be all. Thanks for the comment. I appreciate it. I can just quickly say that, I mean, I wouldn't call it a recycling program, more so a reuse program. Um, however, there should be guidance coming in the near future on sanitation. Um, things get a little bit more interesting when it comes to subsidies for some of this equipment. Uh, but happy to connect James and um, I can't recall the name of the individual you also mentioned. We can we can connect offline on, on some of my thoughts around that. Thank you. I'll reach out. Any other public comments from people that joined via the video link? And if you join via phone and would like to make a public comment, um, you can unmute your phone by hitting star six. All right. I will close the public comment window then. Um, next on our agenda is a review of H612, um, which is now um, Act 166. So, um, as uh, Dave Silverman mentioned, the governor allowed this bill to become law without a signature. I'm going to review the changes that this law makes, but please understand that I'm not providing legal advice. And uh, my interpretations of these sections um, do not have the force of law. I'd also note um, that while many of the sections of the bill take effect on passage, uh, much of what those sections do require rulemaking, meaning the effect will not be immediate. and it will involve a process of stakeholder input. So um, that being said, section one of this bill narrows the definition of hemp infused products in title six, which are the agricultural statutes to exclude hemp derived synthetic cannabinoids or other hemp products uh, that the CCB has determined to be intoxicating by rule. Um, and I think I forget the exact number of the rule, but it's, I think 2.17, some, somewhere around there. Um, so it incorporates those definitions into the definition of hemp infused products. Uh, Section 2A um, permits the use of prizes, awards, or inducements um, in cannabis advertising. Um, Section Three, well, I should say section three through nine, as well as 13 and 14, all relate to the new medical use endorsement, which um, would permit an existing adult use retailer or one that's, uh, or a new applicant to um, kind of have all of the same authorizations to serve patients as a current medical dispensary. Um, things like delivery, curbside pickup, tax exempt sales from cannabis products, um, you know, selling high potency products to registered patients. Um, you know, we, we need to figure out the specifics around what this looks like. Um, our hope is that, um, you know, as we see dispensaries start to close around the state, that we start kind of focusing on allowing patients to shop at existing adult use retailers um, and okay, see those so same access to products and services um, that they are used to at the dispensaries. So more specifically, section three, um, this section allows adult use retail establishments that have this medical use endorsement to sell cannabis products that would otherwise be prohibited in the adult use program to registered patients. 
Section four um, authorizes the CCB to develop the rules to govern the medical use endorsement, um, things like what sort of training um, is going to be required for patient uh, patient facing employees, product segregation, um, privacy, um, things along in those lines. Section four also non related to the medical endorsement allows um, the CCB to adopt rules regarding performance standards that a cannabis cultivator must demonstrate if they seek to expand to a larger tier of cultivation um, that is otherwise unavailable to new applicants or be relegated to a lower tier um, of cultivation. And again, this is an authorization for us to develop rules. So um, there's no, this is, while the authorization has immediate effect, the rules don't exist yet, and we're not going to um, engage with this kind of process until those rules are in, in, in effect. Um, this is the this section also allows the CCB to consider criteria such as population density and the needs of the market when reviewing a proposed location for a new cannabis retail establishment. Um, this. Uh, you know, is generated out of a concern that certain areas of density of retail uh, retail stores um, are making certain areas of the state um, kind of oversaturated, and that there are, are other areas of the state um, that don't have you know easy easily accessible retail establishments. Um, we don't know um, currently what that criteria will look like. Um, to to Dave's point, our hope is that um, we kind of put a basic sketch of what we think is appropriate um, in rule and um, that we receive public comment on whether that's feasible, whether it makes sense. You know, I think everyone on the board would have loved to see um, kind of a elimination of the opt out uh, or opt in uh, presumption, um, you know, to go along with this so that more areas of the state would be accessible to retail. Um, but um, you know, I think this is at least one way where we can have a more equitable distribution of um, cannabis retail establishments. Section five authorizes adult use retailers is back to the medical endorsement with this medical use endorsement, um, the same permissions that a standalone medical dispensary would have, including tax free purchases and access to otherwise prohibited products and delivery. Section six establishes the fee for the medical use endorsement. Um, it's $250. Um, so um, that section doesn't take effect until July 1st of next year. So there will no, there will not be any medically endorsed uh, adult use retailers until at least July 1st of next year. Um, section seven adds ulcerative colitis to the list of conditions that qualify a person for the medical registry. Uh, Section 7A adds some additional safeguards for patients under the age of 21 who are seeking access to the registry. Um, it reintroduces an old concept that a person who's under 21 and applying for a medical card um, must submit a healthcare form uh, with a healthcare provider that they have had a, a minimum of a three month relationship with and that there has been a physical examination, meaning that that um, initial card can't have telehealth. Um, Section eight extends the renewal term from one to three year for all registered patients. I think most people here know that historically, um, chronic there will historically there is a one year term for all um, medical cards. We were able to convince the legislature that. You know, that led to a lot of unnecessary paperwork uh, amongst a very vulnerable population. Um, and so they extended it for all the chronic pain um, last year and this year. They added chronic pain to that kind of three year renewal term. Section nine um, reduces the application and dispensary fees for the kind of standalone medical dispensaries to make them more equitable with an adult use retail license. Um, Section 10 removes the authorization um, to impose a fee for an advertisement review. This is, um, we weren't charging a fee anyway, but this just clarifies that we will never charge a fee for reviewing advertising. Um, section 11 was a technical correction. It involved a typo and um, just kind of a reference to our predecessor agency. Uh, section 11A 
um, creates a working group uh, to study very aspect various aspects of the medical program, um, such as the process for evaluating new qualifying conditions, um, improvements to how the use of cannabis is communicated to patients and patient providers, and whether and how the CCB could regulate vaping devices. Uh, I'll just say right now that I think there's about four, you know, depending on how you slice things, five study committees, distinct study committees that the legislature asked us to conduct um, this summer and fall. And so we're going to be kind of scheduling those with the name stakeholders, but everyone is allowed to participate. Um, we'll post the dates of those um, on our website events page, and we would really encourage participation either at those meetings or through public comments. Um, section 12 um, allows outdoor cultivators um, to use existing farm buildings for basic cannabis drying and storage without having to bring those farm buildings um, up to the full spectrum of the commercial building codes. Sections 13 and 14 exempt cannabis sales um, to medical use patients at one of these medically endorsed adult use retailers. Um, from the cannabis excise tax and sales sales and use taxes. Um, and it also requires uh, record keeping of these sales that the tax department could review if asked. Um, Section 15 uh, replenishes a fund at ACCD, the Cannabis Business Development Fund, that was established to support cannabis businesses um, with technical assistance, loans, and grants. Um, we you know, separately from this, have a report due later, uh, or I guess early next year, about how that money has been um, spent, um, how it's been kind of moved out into the field and the effectiveness of that fund. So um, this just kind of makes sure that there's still kind of a, a body of, uh, of capital to draw from for social equity businesses. Um, Section 15A. Um, asks a group of stakeholders to discuss this very fund, the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Um, is it effective? Is it not effective? What's the impact? Um, and how much uh, on an ongoing basis uh, should be put in that fund to make sure that it's being as impactful as, as possible? Um, section 16 and 17 kind of go together. Um, I know this was a controversial part of the law. Um, this authorizes a municipality to establish uh, certain minimum setbacks um, between the edge of an outdoor cannabis cultivation site and a property boundary. Um, this um, section, well, I should say section 16, um, which is the one that that allows for these setbacks to be created, doesn't go into effect until January 1st, 2025. And um, it has to happen at your local select board level. So, you know, it's really important if you think that you may be on an impacted property, um, as in if you're growing close to your property line, to keep a close eye on what your select boards are doing um, with respect to um, this kind of cultivation siting. Um, section 18 um, is another report requirement. Um, and we're just, you know, it's asked the Cannabis Board and a few other named parties to evaluate what the impact of Section 16 is going to be to the existing cultivators um, and propose uh, some alternatives um, that might be uh, less impactful to the existing cultivators. And I think that is the entirety of the bill. Um, Julian, Kyle, any questions about any of those sections? Nope. Thank nope. you for running through. Thank you, Pepper. Yep. And again, anything that requires rulemaking, um, you know, that will be a very public process, uh, as it always is. Um, and we really encourage input. And for all those study committees, um, you know, the legislature, you know, they make decisions about what they're going to do next year well in advance of the time that they gavel in. Um, and so these reports are like really established the foundation of what they're going to consider. Um, and it's almost too late if we bring these ideas to them, you know, in January. So 
anyone who may be impacted by any of these reports um, or has you know some thoughtful analysis of some of the issues around vaping devices or sighting or um, kind of the medical program, please engage with us over the summer and fall so that we can kind of get a clear picture of um, you know what what sort of we can provide the legislature a clear picture of what what changes um, they should be considering. Yeah, and I will say some of the medical lead driven study committee components do look a little similar to those paying attention of some work we did last year. I still think we want to dust those off, make sure that's still the correct um, approach uh, moving forward. But just be on the lookout. We're trying to figure out internally right now logistics behind all of these committees and scheduling times. So that should start happening over the next couple of weeks. I think we're hopeful to kind of start with some of them mid July, I think, if if memory serves. So be on the lookout. Yeah. Yeah. And and just to underline a point that I made earlier, you don't have to necessarily drop everything you're doing and participate in one of these meetings um, in order to get kind of your ideas on the table. Anytime you submit a public comment, it goes to Julie, Kyle, and my inbox. And so if you look through some of these reports, one of them is on what how we should change cannabis advertising. If you have thoughts about that, you can always email them to us or hit that public comment, and then we can kind of compile those and, and talk about them at the meeting, even if you're not able to attend. Um, all right, Gabe, are you willing to uh, walk through the executive director report while our executive director is out? Yes, if you're willing to walk through to sit through me using PowerPoint, I am willing. I, I think uh, I think we are. It will be exciting okay. for all of us. <laughs> okay, well, uh, standing in for our fearless leader uh, Olga Fitch, uh, I'm Gabe Gelman on the CCB's general counsel. It is not my usual uh, function to put this up for you, so I'm going to try to do that in a way that um, uh, works. Uh, let me see if I can get this in the view it's meant to be in. Uh, you go to slideshow. There we go. Sorry. Okay. From the beginning, here are your here's your executive director report. Thank you for your patience. Um, so first, we had a public engagement um, event on June nineteenth um, uh, uh, concerning the propagator license type that was recently authorized. Um, as folks are aware uh, who've been following that issue, it'll be run on policy while uh, parallel text is proposed as a rule um, that will enable us to um, to roll out licenses without undue delay on the schedule uh, hoped for by the General Assembly. And uh, that was a great event uh, that allowed folks with interest in that to speak directly with the people who'd be administering the program and talk about how they envision it running. Um, the upcoming July uh, topic is yet to be determined. I'm told it depends a little bit on staff availability. So um, stand by for uh, details on what, what the July event will cover. Uh, but um, a lot of gratitude to the people that participated in, the, uh, in this month. Um, so now we'll go over the adult use program licensing data to give everyone an overview and an understanding of what has and hasn't changed empirically in the program. Um, here you see the adult use uh, active licenses by type. We've still got two labs, um, now up to eight wholesalers, 76 retailers, three integrated licensees, uh, 74 manufacturers, and 404 cultivators. Um, looking at the uh, total active licensees by priority status, you can see that a majority are standard, um, are in the standard category, uh, th that making up 357 licensees, 90 licensees are in the social equity category, 120 in economic empowerment. These are issued cultivation licenses by type and tier. Um, and uh, so you can see, I'll leave that up for a second so that uh, folks that want to dig into one or another row uh, can. And uh, moving on, these are issued manufacturer licenses by tier. Um, you've got 12 in tier one, 55 in tier two, and seven in tier three. And cultivator, looking at cultivator licenses by priority status, you can see a similar distribution. Uh, 
majority 62 percent in uh, the standard category 17 is social equity and 21 percent being economic empowerment and here are cult this is an interesting one cultivator licenses by priority status um, and you can see that the distribution of applicants follows more or less the same pattern um, until you get to the, um, the kind of third cluster where you can see um, economic empowerment applicants um, uh, occupying 31 um, uh, spaces there, which is not the pattern seen in the other categories. I'll leave that up just for a second so that folks can study it. And of course, this will be posted online. Uh, then looking at cultivation licenses by priority status, um, in the indoor category, you've got 15% uh, economic empowerment, 21% social equity, and 64% uh, standard. Um, a very similar pattern is seen in a ratio seen in the uh, mixed category. And in outdoor, um, you're seeing just a little bit more, uh, or actually you're not by percentage seeing more standard. Really the same pattern, somewhat fewer uh, social equity status. Uh, applicants by ratio in the outdoor category, but um, all those distributing about the same way. And turning to manufacturer licenses by priority status, um, very similar uh, distribution pattern that we've seen in the others. And manufacturing licenses by priority status. Um, you can see there that uh, economic empowerment um, uh, taking up an unusual amount of uh, tier two, which is, um, but otherwise that same distribution repeating itself. Very similar distribution in retail. And then uh, licenses by priority status, um, you're seeing a bit more or less the same thing. And then license relinquishments by priority status. Um, and the most notable thing about it, that distribution very consistent across. Uh, we're seeing um, relinquishments occurring in the categories um, in almost the same ratio as elsewhere. And re renewal changes are sort of an interesting topic to cover month by month. Um, most applicants, and that's probably a, a relief to the licensing division, stay right in the category that they're in. But um, they're 8% uh, change tier, those being 27% of the, uh, uh, th those being 27 applicants change tier, making up 8%, 18 change type for 5%, and four applicants change both type and tier, um, not common, and makes up 1%. And these are the issued renewal changes for cultivators. And you can see there, uh, outdoor to mixed was the most common change, uh, uh, followed closely by indoor to mixed, and then folks changing from mixed to outdoor. And uh, the least common type change was the three folks uh, changing from mixed to indoor. And here are your issued renewal changes. Uh, for cultivators and manufacturers, most people. This is uh, this one was a little bit of a surprise to me. Most are going up, um, so and then a quarter de decrease, and uh, there are rational business reasons to to make your tier match what you're actually doing. And so, um, kind of a healthy sign that folks are are moving around as their uh, growth dictates. And here's just another way to look at the um, cultivation tier and type changes at renewal. I'll leave this one up without talking too much so that folks that are interested in a particular row can have a look. And then needless to say, the fours are where you're seeing uh, Conspicuous movement, a lot of tier twos going to tier three and outdoor, and a lot of tier ones going up to, uh, to tier three and mixed. Um, but I, you probably don't need me to read that to you. Here's another view of other related data there. This is cultivation tier type changes at renewal. 
And of course, you've got ones across the board, so there isn't really a trend to uh, report. Um, this one is, is followed closely. We have the license canopy capacity square footage. Um, indoors are represented by the lighter green at bottom, outdoor by the darker green at back. And this is capacity versus utilization. Um, and so as you can see there, and uh, I had asked, how do we know this? And of course it's from inspections and, and the inspection data that are collected in the field as to how much uh, a lot of space each licensee is using as a ratio. So um, you can see there are much more, indoor, much more unused um, square footage in the indoor category than in the outdoor category. Um, but the, that one's an interesting one to follow month to month. And then concentration, retail locations and areas of saturation. Um, most of our towns that have a dispensary are coming in at one or two, but of course we have Burlington, our largest city coming in with a uh, conspicuous 11 and one in Q, um, three in Brattleboro and West Brattleboro. Um, and then everybody else there on the list has, it's in the twos except for Barry with its one. And here are pre-qualification applications by status. Um, and pre-qualification, of course, is the system used to get somebody a kind of stamp of approval that is good, that essentially is the licensing staff's guarantee that they're qualified for licensure that they can then sort of cash in for a period of one year from the approval. So um, really a testament to how well that program is working. 68% of the applicants that go through and look for that advanced seal of approval uh, get it, which means a smooth ride is is virtually guaranteed to licensure. Um, our hope is that takes a lot of stress out of the application process, a lot of uncertainty out of the application process, and it also allows our staff to interact early with applicants so that they're not encountering roadblocks, for example, related to the one license rule and other statutory obscurities that might, it would be terrible to tell them late after they've made a significant investment. So by um, running the program, uh, for every applicant, uh, this has been really, really helpful. There are some circumstances in which one just can't go through pre-qualification that aren't necessarily signs of permanent trouble. For example, if somebody has a disqualifying, a presumptively disqualifying criminal conviction, 30 years old, um, it could be kind of obvious to everybody that they'll be fine when they eventually apply, but they have to go through, they can't be pre-qualified. They just have to go through the regular application process. So as you can see, we've got 68 uh, uh, apply, approved, four denied. Denial does not mean a final decision of denial. It means the pre-qualification team says, we can't pre-approve you, but you can go ahead and apply. And there may be a contestable issue that you could bring to the board. Um, 29 were dismissed. Generally, that's occurring for um, uh, from just fall away from people choosing not to follow up. Um, nine incomplete. And you know, the other categories are just um, sort of uh, subcategories of incompletion, um, and 15 were withdrawn. And compliance data comes next. Um, so you can see what the compliance team has been doing in the field. Uh, 109 ins inspections and uh, 16 investigations since the last report. Um, most of those coming into cultivation. Um, integrated are kind of sleepy, and, and they're not numerous, so it makes sense that they would be. And uh, manufacturing, a lot of inspections, no investigations. Uh, retail, 11 inspections, seven investigations, and a single investigation concerning the wholesale category. So most of the activity there happening in cultivation, which makes some sense when you think back to the, the numbers. Um, and then compliance actions in the, in the reporting period. Uh, six, observed product destructions. Usually that's happening voluntarily when somebody has had a crop failure or problem, um, uh, there would be some process if the, if the board wanted to destroy a crop, somebody didn't agree should be destroyed. Um, with two letters of warning, um, no caps went out this uh, period, uh, no notices of summary suspension went out this period, two notices of violation, 17 new complaints were received. Um, complaints may be received from external or internal sources, and so that doesn't necessarily mean 17 members of the public, it may mean that uh, some subcategory of those were um, irregularities um, observed by the licensing team. For example, if somebody shows up and hasn't had insurance for six months or something like that, that could uh, get into that score. 
Um, but that shows you where compliance actions are coming from. And uh, this is a breakdown of the types or sources of uh, new complaints. Uh, pesticides, that five, those are most likely internal and popping because of uh, results seen uh, internally. Uh, general compliance issues are four. Uh, adulteration is three. That's all, that often describes a consumer concern about um, uh, perhaps being sick after consuming a product. Um, and then consumer pro um, uh, so consumer product concern, adulterated cannabis, um, hard to tell those apart. Um, and then unlicensed activity uh, generated one and advertising issue generated one. Gabriel, there's... Oh, I'm sorry. I'll go back. Are those it. new complaints since last month's meeting? New new complaints. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So just just in that one month reporting period, I'm, I should have made that clear. I'm sorry. Thank you. Didn't mean to mess up your PowerPoint advancement. <laughs> I'm on the edge of the cliff here. <laughs> but, um, so this is a look at the medical program. The total patient and caregivers in the registry are actually seem to have leveled off to the extent you could, you could look at these narrow slices and small numbers and see a pattern. Um, this is a decline that's been much talked about and that Act 164, formerly H612, um, effectively proposes to do something about by integrating, um, by making available endorsements. Um, so folks that are interested in this decline, why it's been happening, et cetera, uh, would really be a great time to be involved in the rulemaking process um, with the rules that will be, the rule updates that will be provoked by the new Act 164. Um, but that data sort of is what it is, and, and month over month is barely a change. Okay, and so we have come to the, um, the staff recommendations for approval. The following applicants have demonstrated compliance with all requirements for their license contained in CCB rules. 1.4, 1.5, and uh, uh, Chapter 33, Title 7. And so they are recommended to the board uh, for approval. And the um, board has had full access to any details that it, that it might want about those. But these are the staff's recommendations. Um, I'll, I won't read them to you, but I'll just leave them up so, that, so people can, can see them. Yeah, and for those who join via phone, these will be, um, these will be posted on our website later today. So Klobuzowski and Northern Buds are there. These are renewal. These are renewal recommendations, so probably not a surprise to anybody. More renewals. Okay, um, that is all I've got until there is a uh, one licensing matter or, or that requires the board's uh, specific approval because it is a late application made um, under Rule 1.15.1D that requires the board have a look at the uh, written explanation for the lateness and um, and what happens. So. I'll turn it over to the chair for that matter. Sure. Yeah. Why don't we deal with that separately from these and we can go. Um, um, I guess I should start any questions for Gabe before we look at the um, or before we approve the staff recommendations here. Nope. Okay. No, um, well, is there a motion to approve the recommendations that were just presented to us um, by staff? I move that the board accept the recommendations made by staff to us in this meeting. I will second. Any discussion? Nope. All right. Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so, Gabe, thank you for that. Really great job. I know you were kind of asked to go above and beyond this this week. <laughs> um, well, thank you for uh, being great. Yeah, so um, as as you alluded to, um, there's an issue that came up um, that kind of deserves uh, kind of 
unusual, or I guess not unusual treatment. We certainly anticipated this might happen in our rules. So it's got a few intersecting issues. Um, I'd like to just kind of lay the groundwork for. So, um, you know, under rule 1.15.1, you know, the a licensee must file a timely and sufficient license application at least 30 days prior to the licensee's expiration date, which is kind of the amount of time we decided we need to review a complete application so that there's continuous licensure. Um, and if a licensee fails to file a complete renewal um, by the application uh, or by that time, um, they can submit a renewal application, but they need to accompany it with a written explanation um, as to why they were um, why they didn't meet that deadline and then acceptance of the application is at the board's discretion um, you know kind of the intersecting issues that we saw here are that you know under the vermont tax law um, specifically title 32 section 3113 um, a state agency is not permitted to new, renew a license unless the recipient is in good standing with the department of taxes and in this case, um, the licensee had unresolved tax compliance issues during that kind of 30 day buffer period um, and that the agency um, could not renew the license because of that. And it did expire. Um, and then, you know, as we all know, an unlicensed entity cannot possess commercial quantities of cannabis. Um, this licensee did cooperate uh, in moving the cannabis inventory to a licensed custodian while addressing the tax status um, issue and um, other compliance issues that arose from an inspection. So um, the establishment has provided this written explanation to us as to what happened um, and asked that the late renewal application now complete be accepted by the board. Um, you know, you all have uh, copies of the letter um, as well as the kind of pre licensure inspection report. So the question that we have to discuss now um, is, uh, do we feel comfortable accepting this renewal application based upon the explanation provided and the kind of inspection findings? You know, we um, have all had an opportunity to kind of look at some of those documents. And I think we have essentially three paths forward. Um, one is to accept the application. Um, the other is to deny the application. Um, or the third option is to seek more information from the licensee at one of our um, kind of evidentiary hearings as to kind of what happened and um, whether um, we feel comfortable with the kind of explanation um, and the kind of essentially the correction of the violations. So I open it up to to the board um, for discussion. Um, Can I ask a question, procedural question, Pepper, about that third option? So if mm -hmm. we decided to move in that direction, um, this licensee would not be able to operate in that time. It's not like we could approve, or perhaps this is my question, they could be approved on certain conditions or no? Gabe, hey, can you help me with that? I remember reading Rule 15, 1.15 uh, that we could actually allow a kind of essentially a, a temporary license if we wanted to during this window. Yeah, the board, I, it's a little bit hard to make out Rule 1.15.1, but I do think it could be construed as allowing you to um, issue a contingent um, approval so that you can keep somebody out of the market if you feel like you're leaning toward approval but you need more information before putting a final stamp on it you could invite the person to the, an evidentiary hearing the obvious time to have that would be the hearing day that you've set up to handle when you need more information usually that's happening around one license rule issues and not this these rule 1.15.1 issues but it's the same thing you could take advantage of that time to just hear from the person um it, but in the meanwhile, if you felt it was inappropriate to or just unduly harmful to hold the license up, you could issue a conditional approval. Um, I can't imagine I mean, that's sort of implicit in your authority to approve outright or deny outright. So uh, I, I do think that is an option that you could exercise if you want it. Okay. And then um, how maybe you covered this, Pepper, and I was kind of looking over the documents, but how late was the application initially? 
I have some notes on my desk in the office that lay out this explicit timeline. I just don't have them in front of me. I think I, that there were. Gabe probably knows or licensed. Okay. I don't need to interrogate you necessarily. I'm just, <laughs> just asking the question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know by the day, but I can tell you the, the general gist of it was that the licensee was not completely disengaged, you know, didn't just forget and say nothing for months. Um, there was an ongoing effort to establish um, compliance with the, with the commissioner so that the license could be renewed under 3113. There was a brief period of time where that compliance actually was established. And then we got a notice that it wasn't, that it had fallen apart, that the, that the um, compliance status had flipped back to red for a minute. Um, and that's because that's happening in that 30 day buffer period that's meant to hold everybody up and say the staff can't follow hour by hour developments, it created this problem. Um, but the current tax status is compliant. So you can issuance would be lawful under the tax title 32. Um, and so it's really just a question of um, are you comfortable with what you have received by way of application? Um, as well as the remedial steps that were taken and reported in the most recent pre-inspection um, uh, report that was provided to you. So would it be correct to say that the compliance issues are resolved or the applicant is making progress on those? Would that be correct? Um, I guess the best I can say is that I won't characterize the the inspector's report, but she did address, she had eight issues of concern, I think, and she did feel in her report that each of the eight was was at least getting attention. Sure. Okay. Yeah, the way I, the way I read it, there was eight issues. If they preventing a past inspection to be relicensed, then this licensee was given X amount of time to cure those defects before this meeting or when we cut off for this meeting. And, and given the latest report from last week, it does look like steps have been taken on all uh, yeah. of those deficiencies. Well, I can say that I have some pretty significant concerns about this business, um, especially considering the lack of good standing with the tax department, then getting into a in, into a position of good standing and then falling out of that all within kind of a short amount of time. It kind of feels like a business that might be teetering on the edge um, or is not um, um kind of fully uh able to keep up with you the, the i mean this is a highly regulated industry and, and i apologize for that for everyone you know it just ha it just so happens that this is a very challenging industry um and but at the same time we can't just overlook um you know violations of the regulations and the tax compliance is the foundational one frankly i mean this is a tax and regulate system and here we have compliance with in, in non-compliance with tax and then compliance with tax and then non-compliance and now I guess compliance with tax and I, I don't know what that means I mean it, it sounds to me like um, sometimes there's enough money to pay taxes and sometimes there's not and, and are we doing anyone any favors by setting them up to continue down this path and on the other hand of course the, the kind of counterpoint not to just be kind of both both sides on this, but the counterpoint is, why are we evaluating the the kind of um, the, the business, you know, acceptability of this business? I mean, it's kind of up to them to sink or swim on their own. Like if they meet the minimum requirements and we should give them a license, that's the kind of other half of this. I, I agree with, I mean, I, um, I agree with your concerns, Pepper. And I also, you know, I think most, businesses in their first year, regardless of industry, teeter on the edge in some way, right? That's that's new business ownership. Um, compelling to me was her letter and um, the issues that she's had with the various folks that um, she thought was she was going to get help from and then ultimately didn't. And in 12 months, I can see that being a huge, huge issue. And to your point, I don't, um, you know, why are we evaluating the the efficacy of a business versus whether or not it's compliant with our rules. Right. Right. Exactly. Gabe, do you have a 
I just want to put in a detail about section 3113 of the tax title that might inform your thinking. Um, section 3113 has a lot of subsections and it not only prohibits the renewal of a license um, unless the commissioner is happy in a sense, it also empowers the commissioner mid cycle to request that a licensing agency take, um, withdraw or suspend a license. So what that the reason I mentioned that is it means that the stakes are a little bit lower here in that if the board were to approve the license and the licensee were to fall out of compliance, the commissioner is amply authorized by that section to request that the licensing agency do something on, in the short term. They would not have to wait for the next renewal um, and have a year of non-compliance. So I, I just wanted to point that out to you because it means there's a little bit less risk and a little bit more yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the other issue that that I'm having is, I mean, I assume that uh, the tax compliance or the first bills that are going to be paid. Um, I wonder about the other bills that this person has or the other money that's owed um, to other licensees. Um, you know, and and whether you know if if uh, if the taxes aren't being paid how could those bills possibly be be paid but i you know again is that is that our area of concern or is it strictly at the moment of licensure or at, you know when the application is complete has um the licensee estab met all the minimum criteria yeah and i think the flip side to that or compounding that issue is if if we decide not to allow this licensee to move forward the debts that are owed will most certainly not be paid to those that they're owed to you know, there's no opportunity to try and make up ground. If there are debts to be owed, I should say. Well, and I note that, I mean, the only reason we are considering this one is because it came into us late, but we would not be considering the debt to be owed for any other renewal or whether or not their business was effective for any other renewal. The only reason why we have the opportunity to talk about it is because of the lateness. So I just, I, I just want to point that out as a, I, I, Again, I'm not sure if it's our really our role to decide whether or not the business is effective versus, you know, okay. it was late. Did they have yeah. a good reason for being late? And are they now in compliant with the rules? Because right. I don't partly because I don't want to be in the business of deciding whose business is effective and will be most successful. I don't have an MBA. Right. I yeah. would agree. Neither <laughs> do I. And it may bear mention we have just very limited insight here and of course the only creditor the law cares about is the commissioner of taxes in terms right. of the licensing i mean that's the one hard stop is that the commissioner's not happy nobody's happy um it's also the only credit arrangement we have regulatory insight into um right. and so sometimes uh, uh tax issues can happen without necessarily being an indication of insolvency and you know, can just be a bookkeeping error. I, I at one point, I thought I had filed uh, my my income taxes electronically as you do every year, and I found out years later that the thing hadn't gone through when I applied for some state thing, and the commissioner said I didn't get it. Um, that didn't mean I didn't have the money. It meant that they didn't have their paperwork. It was the same under thirty one thirteen. I couldn't do the thing until I filed that return from five years ago or whatever that I thought they already had. Um, but that's the only insight we have. So um, that that's my, you know, as a regulator, we just hear from the other agencies of government. And um, our big concern really is just the one that I think that you pointed out already, that an approval today wouldn't facilitate noncompliance with the commissioner for the future year. But because of that safety valve in 3113, um, uh, there's less to worry about. So Gabe, am I correct, and this may be a question for licensing, but am I correct that um, the only outstanding issue that was keeping this license from being fully submitted and complete um, was the letter of good standing from the tax department? That's true and it's not. Um, because there was an interruption in licensure, there was there's a requirement that there be a pre-licensure inspection based upon the prior inspection that occurred when there was a license, there were those eight areas that would have meant that that inspection didn't go well unless something was done. But um, that was communicated by compliance to the 
uh, to the licensee, and they were, as um, as Kyle was saying, addressed in a manner that was satisfactory to the inspector in the most recent inspection. Um, so it's not as though everything would have been fine without those eight fixes, but it does appear those eight fixes are done. Okay, I guess um, on that point in the in the um, tax compliance issue, I guess our initial question is. Do we feel like we need to hear from this business at an evidentiary hearing? Do we feel like based upon the record we have, we have all the information we need to either accept or deny this application? I don't feel strongly about a, a, an evidentiary hearing. Okay. But I don't, I don't know what else we can glean scale. at this point. Yeah, I don't know what else to glean from this, this point other than that kind of, uh, you know, furthering and digging into people that this person relied upon to help their business. But again, it's running into what Julie raised is where does our role stop and where does our role start? Okay, so that I'll just put that as, I'll just eliminate that, take that off the table so we can decide today um, whether we accept this application or deny it. Um, does anyone, want to speak in favor or again, you know, in favor of supporting. I think we've all kind of indicated that as long as, you know, this person has corrected the violations and, you know, is in good standing with tax, what are we supposed, what else can we expect? Um, which I think is a good kind of bright line for us. Um, however, you know, are we doing any harm to the overall, to other licensees or anyone else, the market in general, um, our own credibility, if we um, are willing to kind of accept uh, late, late applications. Well, I think the late application thing is a little bit more <clears throat> nuanced as far as setting precedent moving forward and, and what that late submission that we, we kind of heard from, from Gabe and I know the licensing team and in other ways on on how engagement to that point does help to kind of understand why something may have been submitted late, um, notwithstanding the tax compliant issues. So, like I, I think from my perspective here, um, you know, I think we need to find equity across all of this license type um, and afford certain things to other folks in certain situations moving forward. But I think the, the the manner in which something happened in those final days up until something is due is is important, or not even the leading, the final days up until something is due. Um, this isn't trying to do your homework at 11.59, it's p.m. before it's due at midnight. It's, it's, you know, what did those conversations look like ahead of time and what actually prevented you from turning in a complete renewal application? Yeah, it, it matters to me in this case that, um the applicant it sounds like they, they continue to be engaged throughout the process to some level do i have that right it's hard to tell from the documents but maybe gave I, that, I i that would probably require speaking with the compliance agent but it's certainly not the case that anybody went away for two weeks or anything like that um yeah Gabe, this might be a more, I mean, maybe this is something that uh, is more, I don't even know, technical, but um, do you think that this would be considered an extension of the existing license? Um, like, or would this be a new, like this, or would this be a new license that would be issued? This would be a, well, it, am I permitted to answer both? Um, in a way, b both, because you have to start and check every box you would as though it were a new license application. That's why we're having this long discussion. But in terms of, is it the same license? Yes, it's a late renewal of the original license. The license number would stay the same. Its number in the system would stay the same. Uh, everything about its principles and its operation would be the same. Um, so it, I guess the to split the difference, it's a late renewal that requires that because there was an interruption in licensure, the, all the original checks that go out that would happen before a first license, but it's not a first license, it's the same old license. Okay. 
So right. just to add to that question, because I want to add one more piece to that. So if we were to find, if this is the same license and we were to find a month from now that any of those eight items were not actually addressed in some way, they this this license would still be subject to to the normal you know processes of a notice of violation and things like that, right? Wouldn't start new necessarily. That's exactly right. It's just like under 3113, if something doesn't go well in the next month with taxes, the commissioner's still got the commissioner's tools. You've still got your traditional enforcement tools, the notice of violation or the warning letter. Um, okay. So none of those go away. Um, and that may, again, take the, the perception of risk down a little bit in the sense that nobody's hands are tied and you know, all, the, all the usual compliance expectations can be enforced both here and by other agencies of government. Well, anyone need any further discussion on this? No, thank you. No. Okay. Um, so then I would accept a motion to approve. Um, I don't have the license number up. Oh, I can put it up if you'd like. I actually, that was the slide I stopped at. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I hate to make you go back to PowerPoint. You you can do it, Kim. Um, <laughs> you did it so uh, effortlessly uh, this time. Oh, uh, Kimberly is saying we don't actually have the number on there, and she's right. Um, but it would be an approval of Euphoria Cannabis um, as okay. the as the retail. So, is there a motion to approve uh, Euphoria's um, retail license renewal application? I move to approve the license application for Euphoria Cannabis. I will second. Any last discussion? Oh, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. Okay. Um, I think that is all. Um, anyone have any concluding thoughts before we sign off? I hope everyone on the board and on our staff is feeling healthy again soon and it's been a it's been a, it's been a while a week thank um, you for eulogizing um senator sears pepper yes, it's an amazing story it, having i don't know if folks know this but he was born in a prison and to go from you know an adoption to um you know being a powerhouse senator the way he was and the impact that he had i appreciate you eulogizing him at the beginning yeah, and and I'm sorry I didn't talk about um, you know Senator Maza or um, or Jane Kitchell who's retiring. I mean, nothing gets done with without the three of them agreeing. I know it sounds kind of archaic, but it really you know they all um, have had a tremendous impact on um, the creation of the Cannabis Control Board, this market, and just almost every aspect of um, kind of the you know, all of the government services that are provided. So um, they're all incredible. And Dick McCormick, I'll throw in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll adjourn the meeting. Um, see you next month. Take care. Thank you, Gabe. Take care. Feel better. Thank you, everybody. Feel better.